I am delighted today to introduce to you my wonderful colleague, Amelia Reinhardt, uh, who's also the Associate Dean for Faculty here at the Law School. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at Tulane and her law degree at the University of Chicago. Her undergraduate degree was in biomedical engineering. A long time ago in a galaxy far away. And she specializes in intellectual property law, particularly patent law. She is um, uh, a licensed a registered patent, patent attorney, attorney uh, before the U.S. Patent and USPTA. The Patent and Trademark Office. Office, USPTO. You can tell how much I know about that. <laughs> and uh, so she also uh, works with our students who help out with the bench to bits. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, too. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. All right, so the title of my talk is Multiplex Technology Transfer. Um, and um, instead of launching directly into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about patents generally, um, because many of you, I think, are not steeped in the patent model, which several of you have taken my course um, and know quite a bit about it. Um, all right, so what are patents? Um, they are uh, government grants of legal rights to exclude others for making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the invention into the United States or its territories. Um, it has attributes of personal property by statute, um, and so that's important in some of the ownership um, conversations that we'll have in a few minutes. Uh, and then claims are part of your patent rights, and they define the boundaries of those legal rights. Um, and so when you get your patent, um, this is a hot off the press signed by the new PTO director, um, Andre, the last name starts with an I, and I don't know how to pronounce it, but it is really mean. Um, when you get your patent, it comes with a ribbon and a seal, and there's a specification, a lot of words. This is from a very old patent that just has one claim, um, and it says, what I claim is, and then words that define the legal right to your invention. Um, many modern patents include uh, lots of numbered claims, um, and that is a requirement uh, by statute 35 U.S.C. 112, uh, paragraph B. Right, so any inventor is a person, not a dog or a computer, that is established, a person who contributes to the conception of one claim. So even if you have a patent that has 50 claims, um, to become an inventor on that patent who has title, right, and interest in ownership of the patent, um, you simply need to have contributed to only one conception of one claim. And then ownership of the patent invests in all of the inventors, and they share as tenants in common. Um, if you're familiar with property rights, I think that's what they're called in Utah, no? Yes, uh, tenants in common um, in equal shares, um, no matter how many claims you've contributed to the conception of, um, all joint inventors take the same and share equally um, and then may license um, without permission or without any duty of accounting to other inventors, which is a difference from um, real property tenants in common. Like other property, an inventor can assign her patent rights to others. Our assignments and patent rights must be in writing, and they must be recorded at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and those are all publicly available documents. Um, you can download them now by PDF. Uh, because ownership vests in the inventor, employers um, don't automatically obtain ownership simply by having an employee create an invention even during work hours um, or uh, while in the course of their employment. Um, that is usually surprising for people to learn, uh, but that is in fact sort of how we uh, govern ownership um, at the inventorship level. Ownership vests in the people who are the inventors, and then if corporations or employers want ownership interests, they then have to obtain those um, rights from the employees themselves. All right, so, the way that employers do this, uh, whether it's Google or the University of Utah, um, they typically require you to enter into an employment agreement um, where you assign ownership of your inventions as a matter of contract 
um, and as a condition of your employment. Um, and so there are a few ways that you might do this in an agreement. And a recent case at the Supreme Court um, says that the best way to do it is to, on the day you sign on as an employee, um, enter into an agreement that says, I hereby assign anything I invent in the future while I work for you. And that will sort of work <coughs> prospectively um, to transfer your ownership and what you invent over to your employer. If you don't have that language, I currently hereby assign anything I invent in the future, you run the risk of what happened in Stanford versus Roche, where one of the employee, uh, one of the employment agreements applying to Mr. Polardney um, here um, had a hereby assign everything I might invent in the future. Um, the other employment employer had a I will assign when I invent it clause, um, and that employer Stanford lost to the I hereby assign anything I might invent in the future. Um, it's a great case, uh, a very uh, strong majority opinion from Justice Roberts um, and a dissent from Justice Breyer sort of talking about those, that semantic distinction being um, a, a false one and perhaps the Federal Circuit needs to get its act together. Uh, that's a bit in the weeds right. once I patent baseball, but for those of you who are interested in those topics. All right, so what's technology transfer? Um, it's the process of transferring uh, basic science or scientific findings from one organization to another for the purpose of further development and commercialization. All right, so it's basically taking stuff from a laboratory and trying to push it out to us as consumers, commercializing that technology. Um, and there are lots of sort of different phrases for this type of work of the technology transfer sort of a commonly understood um, capturing of what's going on here. Right, so when, when we have technology transfer, we typically have an organization that does the technology transfer service for an institution, whether it be a university or a federal laboratory um, or even a corporation that identifies new technologies within the organization, um, protects those technologies by obtaining protection um, through the patent system, if we're talking about um, inventions or copyrights or trademarks, if we're talking about other types of intellectual property. Um, and our technology transfer office here at the university does handle copywriting and trademarking in addition to uh, patents protection. And then this office also strategizes for development and commercialization of the technology. So they think about the technology, they think about how it can best be protected, and then they think about how it can best be commercialized, whether that means looking for large established licensing partners like Merck or Pfizer, or thinking about starting up a company, creating a startup, or a, what we might call a spin out that's run by the faculty researcher himself and sort of funded by the university where the university takes an equity stake. Um, so all of these sorts of things are the types of things that happen within the technology transfer office, no matter where that office is located, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector. All right, and so when we're thinking about um, life science commercialization, sort of moving from basic science to applied science in the life sciences space, um, we often think of it as a simplified linear model. Um, where we have some publicly funded research, typically the NIH, um, increasingly NSF, DOD, uh, Department of Energy, and others. Um, a bit more uh, private industry funding um, these days, and maybe increasingly some of that as we restrict public research funds. Um, but then go to labs, whether they be in academic institutions or government laboratories themselves. Um, the bench work is done there at the government or university institution, and then that institution then transfers that technology out to some private sector commercialization, right, using the tech transfer um, administrative tools I mentioned a bit ago. And so this is a very simplified model. Obviously, there's lots of moving parts here, and that's kind of part of um, the multiplexity um, that I sort of uh, raise in my title here. Um, so as you know, um, a single movie theater 
uh, very easy to understand what's going on. This is from a very famous patent case that George has heard of, the 72nd Street Courthouse, uh, motion picture patents. Um, and then this is a 30 screen movie theater, which I think is one of the biggest uh, numbers of screens that you can find at movie theaters where you have lots of floors, lots of seating, lots of different people in and out. Um, and so I kind of like to think of technology transfer um, in the types of spaces that I'll be mentioning in a minute as more of a multiplex type of technology transfer, um, where inventors sort of become owners, where we're sort of thinking about how the ownership gets transferred between the institution and the inventor. Um, and there are lots of different relationships at play that make some of these questions more difficult um, than they might have been 100 years ago. Right, so what's happening um, at a place like the University of Utah, um, we'll have a lot of different players involved in this technology transfer process. We'll have inventors, right? People in their laboratories, whether they be faculty, staff, postdocs, students, um, folks who are creating inventions. We have employers, the university um, is one. If we're talking about a government lab, it would be um, the United States government. We have technology transfer administration folks. Um, here, our office is called the Technology and Venture Commercialization Office. Some of you work there. Um, and then we also have private sector actors, right? So we have people who are looking to license technology from the institution. We have folks who may be um, getting funding from outside funding sources. And those funding sources might be publicly funded agencies like NIH or NSF, um, or they might be private industry funding through grants or gifts. Um, most of what I'm sort of talking about today involves publicly funded stuff. So I'm going to talk about Vidal and Stevenson Whitler. Um, but there are lots of other funding models that sort of also implicate lots of different people at different levels in this sort of process. I should have mentioned you can feel free to stop me with questions anytime. Um, it goes without saying. Uh, and I really appreciate it to sort of treat this like a workshop. Um, this is a very, very early stage um, sort of setting up of what I kind of want to do. Um, in the next sort of long term. Um, and so I have some hypotheses at the end and I really appreciate your input. Um, and this is kind of just the background lead up to some of those things. All right, so lots of different actors, lots of different moving parts, um, lots of different questions about ownership, um, inventive rights, um, who is making decisions and those types of things. All right, so there are of course laws and regulations that govern the default rules that I talked about earlier in terms of ownership when we have these types of funding arrangements. Um, so prior to 1980, when a government agency funded a university or an academic institution or some other sort of um, basic science type enterprise, um, the agency typically negotiated directly with the organization for ownership rights, and very typically the agency took ownership rights and the institution did not have any, um, which kind of depended on the arrangement. And there were some agencies that gave away rights and some did not, and it was a very ad hoc system sort of negotiated in the agency um, and institution case-by-case uh, -case basis. Congress kind of decided we needed more incentives to get things commercialized out of universities and other similar institutions who were being funded federally. Um, and so they created, back when they created legislation um, that got out of Congress, <laughs> crazy idea these days, um, they created what we call the bayh Act of 1980, which amended some patent laws to allow academic institutions, small businesses, other folks who receive federal funding um, to retain title to inventions created by their employees. Right? We call them contractors, and there's a definition of contractors in the Bayh-Dole Act. Most often when we talk about the Bayh-Dole Act, we're thinking about academic institutions like a university um, or other uh, similar type institutions, so like nonprofit institutions that do scientific research. Right. Are these for every piece of uh, government funding? Like, if the government gives a five thousand dollars stipend towards a research project, and down the road that leads to a patentable device for the government uh, take effect? Yes, that is my understanding. Um, provided, I think that it goes through. Um, 
the office for sponsored projects process and we have a contract with them it'll have these provisions and then it's sort of, uh, driven by the Bayh-Dole Act I don't know that there's a, a dollar amount um, that sort of um, exempts you from the ability for the institution to retain title but that's a good question I've never gone deeply into the um, the contracts from the OSP and they kind of hold them tightly so actually I've tried to get some and they're like oh, no so that's part of my project is getting more of these types of things um, so contractors have the option to own patents on federally funded inventions um, the contractor obligates itself by taking the funding um, to obtain the patents to seek patent protection to attempt commercialization right to have a tech transfer office that does this type of work um, and then to comply with some very um, technical reporting requirements sort of reporting back to the government the types of disclosures that are being made um, by inventors at the contractor and other sorts of reporting obligations the government um, in exchange gets a non-exclusive non-transferable irrevocable paid up license to practice or have practiced for or on its behalf um, any subject invention right so what happens when you get federal funding um, in your research laboratory at the university um, you make an invention disclosure as you are required to do under the by dole act to your technology transfer office if the technology transfer office decides to obtain a patent over that particular invention you then have to include information in your patent application that it was funded by such and such a grant um, through such and such an agency and that information will appear on the front page of the patent that issues should one issue um, and so it's very clear to everyone um, that the government has um, the ability um, to use that invention should it choose to um, it also once a patent issues and assignments are worked out at the PTO um, they will be there will be um, a notice of this license in the file of the, the assignment record at the patent and trademark office so you will find it yes two questions uh, so who owns this patent the contractor <coughs> The contractor. So is it assigned? Yeah. It is assigned to the contractor. <coughs> and very important duty not mentioned up there in the division of things that would support this invention going out and becoming commercialized is who defends? Who the defends? Patent. The contractor. Oh. Yeah, so uh, remember I mentioned the default rule before is that the inventor, the people get ownership. The only way that the contractor gets ownership is through an employment agreement or some other type of assignment from the inventor. But once that is done, and what by dole sets up is the ability for the university to obtain those assignment agreements from inventors. But once those assignments are done, the defense of the patent, meaning suing infringers, is done by the contractor. Unless they have an exclusive license, and then the exclusive license E can do the defending. Um, and same for ownership. It's completely owned by the contractor once those assignments are in place from the people who are the inventors. The government doesn't have a hand in it. They have the ability um, to use the invention if they would like to. They typically don't use the invention. Um, and uh, they have a couple of more uh, rights. Um, so the contractor also has to share revenue with inventors that's dictated by the statute as well although the contractor gets to decide the amount and the percentage share of the revenue sharing portions um, at the U uh, an inventor uh, aggregate group of inventors whether it's one inventor or five inventors will get 40% of the first 100 thousand uh, dollars of revenue uh, net of patent prosecution costs so they subtract out what it costs to obtain the patent uh, and then 35 percent uh, of the next two hundred thousand um, and then finally 33 percent of any additional net revenue um, the inventors also again as I mentioned earlier have a duty to disclose um, their inventions to their contractors technology transfer office so if you're working in a lab that has uh, federal funding that sort of funds the lab you have a duty to disclose to your institution's technology transfer office the TBC here um, your invention 
So they get to saying, decide what to do with it. You're saying that the university gets 40% on the, the inventors. inventors. 60 of the first 100 The university gets the other 60. Oh, the inventors get 40 The inventors get 40%. That's right. And if there's one inventor, he gets 40%. There are two inventors. Typically, they get 20, 20. Uh, and these things, because they are set by the contractor, can sometimes be negotiated by the inventors. I think, can't, I can't say for sure because I don't run this division of the university, um, I think that we try not to have individually negotiated revenue sharing because it kind of creates some inequity. People who work in the general counsel's office may be uh, better able to say. Uh, clerks in the general counsel's office may be uh, unwilling to say. Um, before we revised our policy in 2012, my understanding is we had a lot of ad hoc one-on-one um, -on -one negotiations for revenue sharing. It created a lot of um, animosity um, because you sort of do these arrangements before you know um, exactly whether your commercialization is going to be lucrative or not. Um, and so it may be um, that it is inequitable among some faculty researchers. Um, so my understanding from the general counsel's office is that we try to adhere to equal splits for the revenue sharing. Yeah. Clarification. Yeah. <clears throat> the hypo here of uh, 5000 for research. Uh, does the government have to provide 100% of that research funding? Uh, or any fraction whatsoever? You, you said you didn't know of a de minimis, de minimis amount. Or is there a de minimis fraction? No. No, so your lab could be running with multiple funding groups. It could be multiple agencies. It could be a mix of private industry funding and federal funding. It could be a mix of university internal seed funding and addition to federal funding. If there's any federal funding in the mix, you need to notify um, through your invention disclosures to the technology transfer office and then when they obtain patenting, they will then notify through your patent application the government has rights in that invention. Um, but there's no fraction of funding either. Um, so when an inventor discloses something to like the technology transfer office, they're the ones that decide if the university wants to try and get it patented, correct? That's exactly right. So if there's a disagreement, can the inventor still go another route to try and get it patented? And then what, how does this then break out? Depends on what you mean by disagreement. Yeah. Um, and so when, let's say I invented something fancy, which would never happen, that's why I'm a lawyer. Uh, I invent something fancy in my federally funded research oh. lab. I make my invention disclosure to the TVC, the Technology Transfer Office, and they consider it and they say, I don't see anything commercializable here. Um, this seems like something that we're not going to be able to sell. Um, it's not in a market that we think is going to be marketable. Um, we don't think we're going to pursue patenting on it. In that instance, they will give it back to the inventor and the inventor will just hold on to ownership of it. Um, oftentimes, the inventor believes in it yeah. And a, the tech transfer office may or may not, and so you might get into a conversation where the inventor try, tries to convince the tech transfer office to take it, um, or maybe they enter into some arrangement where the inventor agrees to be a champion um, and sort of be involved in the process um, and sort of get them further along. Uh, the patenting costs are very high, um, and they're mostly farmed out to external law firms, um, and so ballpark budget is probably a million dollars for patenting fees per year um, for a university of this size probably even higher would be my guess um, that's a lot of money um, and so they're going to be very judicious about um, whether they patent inventions or not um, they'll typically file a lot of provisional <coughs> patent applications which are one-year placeholders but then moving on to the more expensive non-provisionals will be a, a large judgment call and they'll have to sort of sit down and do some due diligence as to uh, market value, commercialization prospects, involvement of the inventor, and other sorts of uh, business things. Does that answer your questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is your question? Yeah. No, I was going to just ask you whether that kind of transfer has to carry with it the obligation to acknowledge the federal contribution, if any, to the research. Um, the, in other words, the, it can't clean the feds out by just transferring it back to the inventor? Uh, you, the inventor then still has to notify that it was funded federally. In his patent. In his patent application. That's right, yeah. 
you can't just eliminate the government by having the invention hold on to it. Yes, yeah, so I had a question about revenue. Is, is that all money that comes in for, for a patent or is that uh, profits? Or it's expenses? net revenue, so they subtract out the costs of procuring the patent. Okay. Um, my guess is if you're involved in um, proceedings at the patent office defending it or infringement litigation, they'll subtract that out of your licensing revenue as well if you have any. Um, but yeah, so it's net it's net of the costs on obtaining the patent protection. Uh, but typically it's licensing revenue. And some companies don't make any licensing revenue. So it just kind of depends on the commercialization process and whether you're sort of in the black rather than the red. At what point you at what point you as an inventor start receiving a check, right, as part of the revenue share. All right, so two sort of important other aspects of Baidul is that the government, by statute, has what we call march-in rights. Um, and so the government has the right to come in and tell the contractor, um, we are going to add some licensees to your pool. We've identified some reasonable licensees, and we're going to unravel an exclusive license that you've entered into. Um, the government has never exercised those march-in rights in 38 years of the Vital Act being in existence. Um, I think it's safe to say um, it's unlikely that they ever will exercise march-in rights. Uh, the most recent petition um, involved, is it Myriad? The, the letter to the senators about pricing? There's always some pri there's always uh, letters to senators about pricing. Was there an official petition for March and Rights? Maybe for Sabaldi, which is another uh, the forty thousand uh, dollar hepatitis C uh, treatment that I'll sort of mention in a little bit as well. Um, I there there I think there was a recent petition also for the EpiPen, possibly at some point. Those petitions have been uh, summarily rejected uh, by the government. They've never really uh, attempted any kind of march-in rights. Um, less uh, known to people who sort of study vital, um, in fact, there's some other limitations. So if you mess up on your reporting requirements, the government can claim the invention back, sort of get title to the patent. Um, and then there is an exceptional case um, exemption uh, where the government can get title back as well. So um, it has actually exercised that provision a handful of times. Um, it has done so for things that we might call research interme intermediaries or research tools. Um, so things that lots of labs will be using to get to their next step of inventions. Um, it, the government will come in and say, we're going to take title to this specific research tool, and then we're going to give access to it to all institutions who are using this um, intermediary. Um, there were some of these that were done for some of the cDNA portions, uh, for those of you familiar with the Myriad case. Um, all right, so the University of Utah has a very large um, commercialization presence. Um, the office is called the TDC, the Technology and Venture Commercialization Office. Um, it has been most recently identified as the number one technology transfer office in the country in 2017. Um, that's $211.8 million in licensing income over a three-year period, 2012 to 2015, um, and a uh, 69 startups or spin-outs which are drawn on technology that is disclosed to the TVC um, through the technology transfer process from um, researchers around campus. Most of that, I would say, uh, Almost all of that number, uh, both of those numbers, involve inventions that either come from um, engineering or uh, health sciences. <coughs> There's a handful of other inventions that are spread about some of the other units, uh, but it's mostly engineering and life sciences, um, and we're relatively well known um, in the life science space for being uh, a large technology transfer um, organization. All right, so this brings me to sort of two um, what I'm calling multiplexity um, interesting scenarios. Um, and one, uh, several of you know uh, quite a bit about, and I'm going to talk about, uh, um, and the other sort of a early stage or project looking at some of those things. Um, so the Bench to Bedside competition um, is a student composition, uh, competition involving medical students 
graduate students um, from around campus. It's run by the Center for Medical Innovation, which is funded by Health Sciences. Um, <laughs> And it essentially gathers teams together, uh, gives them some um, educational components on both patent law, business models, teams get mentors that are out in the venture capital space, um, and it's meant to be a way to identify clinical needs um, and move them to the marketplace. And it's a competition for students, and they get $500 to enter the competition to build prototypes, to develop their invention, um, to have team meetings and pizza, I guess. Um, and then over the course of the eight or nine months that the competition lasts, um, they identify a clinical need, come up with a solution to that problem, develop a prototype, uh, consult with our fellows, the Center for Biomedical, uh, Law and Biomedical Sciences, um, and think about patenting strategies. And then there's a big competition night um, where the teams pitch their inventions to the public at the state capitol. Um, that'll happen April 9th, for those of you who are interested. It's a really fun night. Um, and you can, there's the, the people's choice, so you can vote on the one that you think should win. Um, and there are multiple stages of prizes. Um, including, I think, $10,000, $15,000 for the big winner to move on to the next stages of development of their invention. So this sounds a lot like the types of things that are happening in that uh, simplified linear model that I sort of pitched earlier, except that these folks are not faculty researchers and they're not locked into any employment agreement as I described earlier. Right. They're just students who are participating in a competition that's funded by the university, but not at high levels. And they're using some university resources, but not a ton. Um, and some of, some of the questions that we have been running into um, in our five years of providing patent services through the Bench to Bedside competition um, are questions about student ownership. So when I first started working um, with student inventors five years ago, it seems unbelievable it's been five years that we've had CMI fellows, um, we had sort of an ad hoc arrangement with the general counsel's office that said, don't worry about it, student competitions, we're not going to claim ownership, but if you go back and look at our invention policy that's online, it applies to students who use non-incidental university resources. And so a question becomes, is the $500, the use of the prototyping lab, um, all of these sort of educational enterprises part of non-incidental university resources? That's a legal question, and we don't provide legal advice. So we just kind of leave students hanging with that, like, oh, oh, maybe, here's the policy. Um, but in the, in the course of the five years, they're talking about talking with students about ownership and how we're going to sort of capture um, some of the stuff. Um, this year, we're sort of working on a real legal paper, a legal research paper about whether students actually have ownership over their inventions um, and and what those types of policies um, should look like. So our current policy says uh, non-incidental uh, university resources triggers ownership over student invention. Um, that's a web-based policy. And so question number one is, is that an enforceable contract as to the student? And what consideration are they providing? Is it simply entering into the competition? Um, those are important questions. Um, and we went ahead and looked at other uh, Pac-12 schools and peer schools who are asking what their invention policies are. And I think we found one that gives 100% ownership to students, whether they are engaged in um, design projects through courses or competitions. Student invents it, student owns it. That's the University of Michigan. Um, and then we found a couple of others that said um, competitions like this allow for ownership by students, but if they're doing it in a course that's sort of sponsored by the university, um, the university takes ownership. Again, when the university takes ownership through the Bayh-Dole Act, that triggers a duty to disclose to the TBC, and you give up ownership, and you're sort of willing to take the royalty share. Right? You no longer own um, any right title or interest in the patent. Um, and so we're kind of still looking at some of those policies, um, and 
the two sort of hypotheses that we're sort of thinking about um, is one, are these web-based student and vendor ownership policies enforceable? Um, and if they're not enforceable, what work are they doing? Right? Are they scaring students into thinking they have to give up ownership? Are they sort of setting some kind of norm of owner? Andrew's like shaking his head. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure the answer to that is yes. Uh, I'm not sure about the enforceability question. I think probably not enforceable in the sense that I don't think students read these things very carefully. I don't think that they're presented to them very carefully. And I think there's a big sort of adequate notice mutual assent problem if there's not a consideration problem. Um, but if they're not enforceable, I think students still um, are influenced by them. I think they're, um, they have a, a, a deep-seated um, influence on how students think of themselves in the, in the ownership picture of where are they in the multiplex, I guess is one way to put it. Um, yeah. So I'm curious about whether it's non-incidental to live in the Lausanne housing. Yeah, Lausanne has actually like sort of triggered a lot of these conversations. So um, when we first started, uh, again, providing patent services to these students, we had a general understanding with the general counsel's office that these students um, would not be under a duty to disclose to the TVC. They could choose to, they could give up ownership, they could assign their invention to the TVC, but they weren't required to. It was really only after they built Lasan Studios and we started having conversations about having a whole population of students who are entrepreneur, entrepreneurial in nature um, that there was a push to have that more formalized, to have more of a policy like the University of Michigan has where a student own all the things that students come up with regardless of whether it's in the garage at the Lasan Studios <laughs> or whether it's you know in their off-campus apartment or whether it's related to a course or related to like their dad's like horse farm whatever right um, and that created uh, some contentious conversations around campus so the Lasan folks feel strongly we should have a University of Michigan type policy to attract students to say that we are entrepreneurial, right? So that's kind of how Salt Lake City sells itself. That's how the university kind of sells itself. Um, the general counsel's office is less comfortable with that type of policy, um, and as is the TBC. Um, and so that kind of builds toward our second hypothesis, which is um, are student inventors better off giving ownership to the university? Sort of um, taking that <coughs> revenue share um, in exchange for the TVC services and sort of not being involved in the process. I think that's probably um, an individual sort of question. I think that some students are going to be very entrepreneurial um, and will be better off owning um, the technology themselves. Other students, I myself would be terrible at owning <coughs> technology. I would be better off in the TVC sort of space. Uh, Brian and George. Just to go along with that, it seems like it would be better by choice. One of the biggest bones of contention uh, for me and my classmates during our bioengineering undergrads, when we did a lot of our design projects, we were told, if you come up with something on your own at the library using the 3D printers, that's yours. But if you use any of the private bioengineering workshops, that's right. so, suddenly it's universities. And to us, we're like, don't we get to choose? Or wouldn't it be smarter if we chose? Because sometimes you don't want what we're making. But if you're going to make money on it, maybe I do want it. And I think part of what has sort of driven us to some of these research questions is that the answer is unclear. Right? So one could make an argument that using the 3D printer at the library is a non-incidental university use. I don't know that I would go that far, but you could make that argument. Probably not right now because for a lot of the general ones... Is it open to the to public? Yeah, they're open to the public and you have to provide your own filament. This is how old I am. Yeah, open to the public. Maybe not. It's you know, non, non incidental university um, uses. But the course provided instruction, right, the lab specific stuff, um, does, is university incidental, not, is non incidental university use. Is that the right? Phrase, trying to teach. Non -incidental non -incidental. University. That also depends on the lab because for some of the course specific ones like biodesign, there's a locked room that you can't go into unless you're in the class and using that and that's understandable. But there's also the machine shop where as long as you've done the training course, you can come in on your own discretion. Does that 
change it where it's still technically universal. What do you think? Probably because, again, you had to pay to take the university course to prep yourself for the use of this, and you still are <coughs> performing it in a setting that's not open to the public. It's still restricted by training level. I think that's probably true, right? And I think those are the right questions to be asking. So is it open to the public who has access to these things? Um, maybe not the general public, but all students might still be um, incidental university uses. Um, if you are the TBC, um, I don't know that you want to be making these decisions one by one. Right. And so having a clear policy, right, what's the adage, like it's better to have a clear but wrong policy than a confusing but right one. Um, and so the, the, the things that we sort of run into, uh, this just, who owns this stuff? And students regularly ask us these questions. Um, and if they don't have a faculty member on their team, then the university has no ownership in that technology at all. Sometimes they have a faculty member on their team if they've provided some contribution to a conception to what we might envision will be a claim. Um, and some of these things are kind of fluid. So we might start with um, a team that has a faculty member that we would consider an inventor, um, which is a question of law. And then as they morph their product, right, as they sort of get closer to something that might be commercializable, that conception becomes something that is not, no longer part of the invention, right? It's a feature we've deleted. That inventor gets deleted, now we have a 100% student team. We can work the other way as well. Um, it's sort of very complicated sort of issues. They're sort of deciding on a case by case basis. Yeah, George. Yeah. So, so a few things. This is actually, this is interesting, really interesting. Um, so, so, a couple of things. And first, uh, you looked at the top 10 or past 10 and back 12 schools for comparables. I mean, one, Another thing you might look at is, is schools that have big competitions. Um, you know, I, I was on the board of the MIT, mm -hmm. um, you know, or 50K competition. And every year, those people come up with, you know, important inventions. Right. Um, they make a fair These amount of money. These are important inventions, too. Well, that's not they, diminish our they are, that they are, they are. But, but, you know, but venture capitalists flock to this thing, and, and right. the students, the teams definitely own the inventions. So yeah, we pulled MIT, did we? Yeah. Yeah. So MIT, uh, like their generic policy, I pulled, but I can't get like competition policy, right? That's probably something that's handed out before, like at a it, at a competition. Yeah, the, the the competitions are separate. They're they're actually run separately from our main university. Um, so that may be part of it, also, right? Yeah. I mean, if if I, if I know the people there, I used to represent MIT, and so um, you know, I can. Yeah. No, that would be great. Yeah. Um. And then, so in the sciences, right, this, this issue, so the, these competitions I've never really thought much about, but in the sciences, this issue comes up a lot with graduate students, right? So graduate, graduate students, students typically, um, so those of you who are fellows probably had to sign an employment agreement where you agreed that any invention that you created in the course of your fellowship working on important law projects in this building um, <laughs> are hereby assigned to the university. So graduate students um, who are getting paid a stipend, um, whether they be fellows, graduate assistantships, um, or just regular RAs, um, my understanding is that none of you escape without having signed that agreement. So, so not all universities treat graduate students in that, in that way. way, right? So some differentiate between postdocs who are clearly employees right. And grad students who are viewed more as students, like undergrads. And, and I might depend also on the funding of that graduate student, right? Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, I, I just one of my colleagues at Wash U, um, when we were both there, Jimmy Carter Johnson, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, has looked yeah. into these yeah. things. And so, so Gina, I won't say more if you you like looked at her stuff, yeah, on this, but. Um, both she and her husband were grad students, right? And yeah, no, and, she has uh, like two or three good papers on non-faculty inventors and sort of yep, how they in yep. this case. Yeah. And the big fight there is whether the faculty will share their revenue share with all those students and techs and postdocs. Right. They usually don't yeah. think about that. Just the, in case the other sort of interesting aspect of this that we have been learning over the course of the bench to bedside um, competition work that we've done here um, is one fundamentally researchers don't know the legal definition of inventor 
and they don't realize that it's a legal definition. I, I my re researcher, don't decide who's the, I don't say, I like these five postdocs, I don't like these other four, <laughs> and so me and these five are going to be on the patents, but these other four are not going to be. That's not how inventorship works, right? It's a legal question. Yeah, um, I, you yeah. should caution the faculty and your licensing area that that's a perfect way to set up a patent that can be invalidated during litigation. That's right. By not naming the proper inventor. By having a misjoinder or non-joinder, by having the wrong number of inventors or having inventors on there who weren't actually inventors. And so many of the conversations that we have with our student inventors are who contributed to the conception of the invention that we're talking about, the claims that we framed for the provisional, of course, understanding that those will be fluid over time and may change. Um, they don't want to get it because they want inventorship to be defined by how they run their lab, how they decide who's the first author on a paper, how they decide who's going to be on a paper. Um, and so the, I think that's been one of our biggest obstacles is having honest conversations with teams. You might be a team of three, and one guy is a builder, but he hasn't contributed to the conception of the invention. He's not an inventor, and he doesn't get any ownership. It might be a faculty guy who said, I see a problem, and the students solve the problem. That's a closer question, but probably not an inventor. Right? It's a relatively well-recognized problem. That faculty person wants to be on the patent. Well, there is a tendency for overreach in any research team, That's right. whether it's the university or in a private entity. And the research team leader, unless they're very well self-controlled and educated in this, there's a tendency for them to want to put, get themselves on, be the inventor, <laughs> and other people are just, That's right. you know, equipment they use. To and it can be a very, patent. very expensive mistake. Yeah. You can have your patent to be invalidated, or maybe even worse, so um, you get to a litigation where we add an inventor who has exclusively licensed out to the infringement defendant, Ooh. and now you no longer get a remedy. Yeah. Right? That's bad. Right? And so it's very important to sort of get these questions answered correctly, and it's hard for us to answer them um, for some of these student teams, but it sort of raises that question of, all of these people are in the lab and they're all contributing, but not all of them are contributing in a legally relevant way to who is an inventor, and only inventors carry ownership over. There's a question over there. Oh, yeah, question. Um, so I'm an undergraduate, and so I don't, this is kind of technical, but my question was just kind of like, so you said that the policies are sometimes not clear for a lot of students who engage in these competitions and things. So. Do you see frequently that a lot of students are wanting, like, are preferring to have the revenue to themselves rather than engaging in TVC because they don't understand what it? Um, I I think that the students that we run into, uh, I think, are um, increasingly more sophisticated, sort of understanding that we do have a policy. Um, I there there are several teams who have told me that they have refused faculty input to avoid having a faculty member right. on their uh, technology, um, sort of preserve it in the student space, preserve it for student ownership. Uh, so I think it's probably mixed in terms of um, sort of understanding how ownership works. We meet with the competition participants <coughs> very early in the process, and we give them what we know about student ownership, whether it's um, they're currently working on a written policy from the general counsel's office that sort of captures all of this stuff, but it's currently in draft form. So we typically point to the uh, invention policy, which is on the web. Um, it's a dense room, I have to say. It's not terribly the clear, it's not the clearest thing I've ever seen in my life, uh, but it tracks to that non-incidental use of university resources. And it's up to you as the student to kind of decide what I'm doing, whether it be a competition or working, you know, in an advisor's lab on a free basis, which is what I did in undergrad. I showed up at a lab and said, I like what you're doing. Could I tinker in here? And I said, sure. So a lot of this will be like afterthought for a lot of students. The ownership question? I, I would imagine. And so that's kind of another thing that's sort of later in my next step, sort of thinking about um, motivation for inventing. So 
our whole framework of the patent system is that the incentive of the patent rights so it drives people to create inventions. That's clearly not true in absolute terms, right? Uh, because people are tinkerers and they create things. And um, I don't think that people are sort of joining labs with these <coughs> thought that like I'm inventing to get a patent reward. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. So there's a lot of psychology out there how people are motivated. Um, but I think for the students that we talk to in the competition, it is a mixed motivation. Um, they, when they learn have the, when they learn that they have the ability to get free patent services from us, they line up and meet with us, <laughs> right? Uh, but if they didn't know that, I don't know how enthusiastic they would be about patenting. Um, or if they had to pay $10,000 for what we're doing. I'm not sure, right? That's a kind of a different question. But that would be a good research question too, sort of what's driving people. Um, and it, it's free, right? And you get to meet with Jason and Andrew and Erica. So it's, it's a good time. Jolly good office hours with this crew. Um, that might be part of it too. But it'd be part of an inventive community. Um, and you're laughing, like, because Jason and Andrew and Erica are fun to hang out with. Um, <laughs> but, all, but also the inventive community sort of being part of a process or being part of what we might call the TBC a diligence team. So like business people and tech people and law people kind of all coming together and saying, okay, we have an invention here. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to get this out into the world? Um, and typically that's sort of... Um, the mixed motivation question really interests me because our sort of common understanding is that what drives people is to get out into the world to make profits. But in the translational medicine space, that's not always 100% true, right? A lot of teams that we meet with are like, I suffer from sleep paralysis or something else. I suffer from this thing, and I want to solve that problem for myself and all the other people that suffer from this thing. That person is not being driven by an extrinsic reward of patent rights. But I don't think that they would tear up the check that comes in the mail either, right? <laughs> um, and so it's kind of a definitely a mixed motive sort of situation. All right, so the other multiplexity uh, problem that I would like to do a lot more work sort of looking at um, involves the VA. Um, and so uh, there's a large uh, VA medical center here. Um, there are, I think, 130-ish VA medical centers around the country um, where um, the facility treats patients. It is a hospital, patient care, outpatient therapy, et cetera. But they also have research centers where they do translational medicine research. They are a government federal laboratory in that sense. Um, and so the employees at the VA are federal employees. And it's as though they're working at the NIH, although they are working at these uh, dispersed, decentralized medical centers across the country. Um, and then the other um, complex layer is that almost all of those 130-ish VA medical centers um, are partnered in an inter-institutional inter agreement with an academic affiliate um, such that they have dual appointees where you have a researcher at the VA who is both an employee of the U and an employee of the federal government making money on both sides, typically at full FTE at both, um, who owns the stuff that they invent? And the easy answer is, well, both of them. And that's true in some cases, but not all. Um, and that's where it becomes kind of complicated. All right, so the Bayh-Dole Act covers contractors, universities, academic institutions, nonprofits, small businesses that take federal funding. The Stevenson Widler Act, I believe it, Widler, Widler? Widler. Widler, all oh, right. I've been laboring in my office pronouncing it wrong for quite a while. A Widler Act, um, same time as Bayh-Dole, um, sort of toward the same goal, commercialization of inventions that come out of federally funded spaces. But the Stevenson Widler Act is directed toward federal employees. Instead of an employment agreement, if you're a federal employee, your ownership obligations are driven by statute. Okay, so they're driven through 15 U.S.C. 3710, um, CFR regulation. Um, and there, it is only if you create the invention during your work hours on official government business or with government resources. And there's very specific statutory language that governs um, when a uh, federal employee is obligated to assign any inventions they create 
over to the federal government. Um, they also have a percent revenue sharing provision. I think it's 40. Um, but they have a yearly cap. So even if your commercialization goes gangbusters, you're going to be capped at $150,000 a year uh, per the federal employee. And the government, much like the TBC, like I mentioned earlier, can decline. They de decline ownership over your invention as a federal employee and take a license. Or they can just decline and not take a license. Just leave it with you, federal employee, who developed this invention, um, even though it was on, on your work time or with governmental resources. Also in the Stevenson-Widler Act, sort of as amended in 1986 through the Federal Technology Transfer Act, all federal lab laboratories, laboratories um, and agencies, and that includes work done at VA medical centers, um, can enter into cooperative research and development agreements with private industry. And through this provision, the CRADA, however it's pronounced, the CRADA um, can have invention ownership be assigned fully to the industry partner that's a private sector actor. So it might be that a federal laboratory enters into a CRADA with an industry partner and in that agreement, which is perfectly legal, uh, the parties can agree that the industry partner owns all of the stuff invented by the federal employees. <laughs> all right, so this is what happens at the VA. So um, I mentioned Sovaldi earlier. Um, maybe the most expensive drug on the VA formulary, um, $40,000 at the VA discount per treatment outraging to Congress um, and the um, it is uh, manufactured by Gilead um, but it was originally put out by a company that was a startup company started by a VA employee um, who also is an academic affiliate at Emory in Atlanta um, and so that's a uh, Dr. Shinazi uh, up there and um, he spun out a company his company patented Savaldi, the hepatitis C treatment. Um, that company was bought by Gilead for $11 billion. Um, and his share was a mere $440 million. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, your Congress folks are a bit upset about this. Um, and when sort of they started asking questions, about the invention of Savaldi and sort of how it came to be. Um, as it turns out, the patents that have been identified in the Orange Book, which is the FDA's way of identify, tracking patents to pharmaceutical drugs, um, Dr. Shinazi is not an inventor on any of those patents, but they were funneled through his startup company. Right, so he started a company outside of the VA and Emory um, called Pharmacet. Um, in his company, he hired employees. Those employees are inventors on the patents that we associate with this particular drug. Uh, the other sort of um, underlying sort of, uh, leaves a bad taste in your mouth, uh, <laughs> facts about Savaldi um, is that sort of all these economists sort of suggest um, that the pricing there is not drawn toward research and development, uh, but drawn towards sort of paying out the $11 billion um, that's sort of cost to acquire it on the part of Gilead. Um, so it's kind of a tangled web um, where the VA and Emory have tried to claim rights over um, these uh, inventions in this drug, and they have been denied to them. Uh, this is Dr. Sanjeev Narayan um, at the VA in San Diego and also an academic affiliate at the University of San Diego um, and now uh, with Stanford. And he invented uh, these uh, catheters for atrial fibrillation, um, so AFib sort of treatment. Um, also spun out into a startup called Tapera that was bought by Abbott Labs for $250 million. I haven't been able to figure out how much money he made off of that. But in this instance, the VA owns half of the patents here. So in their interinstitutional agreement between the University of California system and the VA, the VA got 50% ownership due to his dual appointee status. And so whatever these things which are selling for, they're creating a revenue share um, for the VA in terms of the licensing arrangement. But that creates additional problems in the sense that when the VA buys these things, it's sort of paying itself in a weird conflict of interest 
situation. Um, as far as I can tell, they're not buying these things in high numbers yet. It's sort of relatively new technology, but there are procurement contracts out there with the VA um, for this technology from Abbott. This is a University of Utah um, VA joint invention um, through the uh, George Wallen uh, Salt Lake City VA Medical Center. Um, this is a uh, percutaneous osseointegration prosthetic, which means that the, um, the prosthetic is bolted into your femur, um, a, a, unlike the sort of socket prosthetic that you're sort of accustomed to seeing. Um, Apparently, um, it, it makes for much better load bearing. Um, it's a lot better prosthetic. Uh, the challenge is being the interface between um, the bone entry and your skin. Um, sort of working on some technology there. Uh, but this is a VA uh, slash University of Utah team. All of the work was done at the VA in the bone and joint lab. And it is 100% owned by the University of Utah. Um, I don't know why, because we do have an interinstitutional agreement with the VA, and so I don't know if it's because the VA declined ownership, thinking it might not go anywhere, which is kind of unusual for these types of devices, because the VA very much cares about its patient population when it's thinking about the types of technologies that it seeks ownership over. Um, but the weird thing about the VA is that up until even the year 2000, they declined ownership over all inventions thinking um, that their mission was really veteran patient care um, and they just didn't want to be in the business of taking ownership over technology um, and then there was a presidential order that said this is really a bad idea um, agencies are meant to be engaged in the technology transfer process so it never even had a tech transfer office um, centrally until after the year 2000 um, and so they're very, very much behind a lot of agencies in terms of technology transfer and how they think about patenting and commercializing. And so this may have been an instance where they gave all of the rights to the university as an academic affiliate who could participate in the tech transfer process and do it quite well. Uh, but in the meantime, um, if this becomes something that's commercializable, the VA doesn't have any interest in it. Yeah. And by the, to be fair, there may be some federal funding, right, which would give the government a non-exclusive license to have it practiced on their behalf, which they won't exercise, much like they don't do it for NIH inventions. But in doing so, aren't they also protecting themselves because load-bearing uh, osteointegrated prosthetics can also increase osteolysis and other bone degradation just based on how the device is built and how it's incorporated into the body? Yeah, I mean, this is not uh, commercialized yet. So these are in early feasibility studies. So I would hope that they would sort of, I mean, obviously they wouldn't prescribe to their patients something that they thought would be harmful in that way, right? So if they were talking about, um, what's the right word for it? The, where the bone resorbs itself, right? Um, where you're sort of shifting the, uh, the load bearing on the bone and the bone ends up sort of changing its shape, sort of changing its own load bearing. You would think that they worked that out in their clinical trials slash feasibility studies before they start putting it into people. But there are currently 10 veterans based out of the Salt Lake City Medical Center that have these uh, percutaneous osseointegration prosthetics. Um, and they um, claim that they are far superior to the socket-based prosthetics that they were using before. It's a 10-year study, so it's unclear, um, you know, sort of how that bone uh, resorption will work in the future, but yeah. yeah okay, so first, I guess, so this is a joint, joint invention. Joint, joint invention, yes. Joint, joint. <laughs> joint <laughs> uh, that wasn't my question. Um, that was a pun. <laughs> so, so is the way maybe that the university ends up with ownership of this invention that these, at least some of these doctors have a joint faculty appointment here at the U, which a lot of them do at the VA, right? But it's a and dual appointee, right, which is sort right. of a classic definition in these agreements. A dual appointee will then have to assign to both. So a dual appointee under a normal agreement that I've looked at and sort of looking at the assignments of the PTO. A, it's a CRADA? Do we have a CRADA with the VA? Or? Uh, we don't have, a, a, academic affiliates don't have CRADAs. They have oh, CTAAs no. or okay. invention management agreements. Um, I, that's, we've filed a grammar request to get our agreement 
um, with the VA, so I can just look at it. Um, yeah. And we haven't gotten it back yet, so I can't say. Um, it's relatively old, so it's probably a CTAA. Mm -hmm. um, and in those older agreements, the VA let the academic affiliate make all of the decisions, but mm -hmm. still should have retained some ownership. And so my guess is maybe the VA didn't want ownership over this particular device. I'm not I mean, sure. If the VA thought of itself more as a funder, right, under Phi Dole, as opposed to, you know, a joint researcher under Stevenson Weidler, right. maybe they thought it they could just go that route and so give the contract. That's or? another question, right? So yeah. it is um, VA facilities, right? So it's a lab at the VA. Mm -hmm. We have dual appointees. So on the team here, um, there are a couple of other folks on the patent, maybe one or two other people on the patents that have been filed for this, that have been licensed out to a surgical facility, a uh, surgical company. Um, three of the four um, our VA employees like listed on the federal.gov site um, and also university employees are receiving salary from both of them, yeah. um, in which case they would both be obligated um, to, they have to jointly assign. So what the assignments of the PTO look like is like me, Amelia Reinhart, hereby assign jointly to the University of Utah Research Foundation mm -hmm. and the Department of Veterans Affairs. In this particular case, it's only I assigned to UURF. There's no veterans I mentioned. Um, they did have different grants, right? So it's some funding from the VA, but also some funding from NIH and <coughs> DOD, I believe, mm -hmm. um, which then creates licenses in the government, but not ownership. Right. So it may, that's a, that could be part of um, a, de a decision to decline ownership might just be the government license is enough. Or we don't need to deal with the headache of ownership. Not even think about that. Just, just you know, not wanting to deal with it because they don't have a licensing office at the VA and saying, well, well, know, they do have a licensing like, office now, right? But it's but, it's the VA seems to be very locally run, right? The mm -hmm. licensing office, the tech transfer office of the VA is in DC. It's oh, not right, a Salt Lake right, City, okay, yeah, right, and it requires invention disclosures, and they're obligated. In all of the agreements and by the Stevenson Weidler Act, if you're a VA employee who makes an invention, you're obligated to disclose that to your central technology transfer officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the question is one of the questions in Savaldi was whether Shinabi refused to make that disclosure. He held on to his invention and fumbled it through his startup instead of making a disclosure to the VA. That was a, that's been a congressional investigation. Um, and what the penalty is, if you refuse to make a disclosure and you make $440 million on a drug, what's our legal hook to get some of that money from you? Or, or a discount on the drug so that we can treat all of the veterans who need it, which is how this came up in conversation at Congress was, um, we the VA can't afford to give this drug to all of our veterans who need it, what should we do? And Congress was like, uh, the price should be lower. And they're like, oh, we can't get it lower. Um, and so that kind of triggered a whole congressional investigation as to whether this guy failed to disclose something that he carried through to a private company. Um, so all of these inventors have a duty to disclose. One sort of working question is how often do they not disclose in order to sort of either circumvent the $150,000 cap um, because they're more loyal to the academic affiliate, right? That might be another, I might be, one FTE at Utah and one FTE at the VA, but I, I consider myself a Utah employee, mm -hmm. right? That might be playing into some of what's going on here as well. All right, so the couple of hypotheses here, are, does the VA's timidity in claiming, claiming ownership over them, which are what George and I were just discussing, um, result in a reduced number of patents jointly owned by the VA? Does it result in reduced commercialization? I don't really know the answer to that, um, but I would like to look at a lot more of the contracts that they have in terms of what uh, patent counts are. Um, the number of disclosures is roughly similar, similar to other agencies that get the same amount of budgets that they get. Um, so like the USDA and the, and the VA kind of have a similar budget assessment for research. Um, and the USDA turns out like uh, 10 times as many patents um, and patent applications. So that's kind of an interesting statistic um, that might be interesting to look at uh, down the road. Um, and the other sort of question 
um, that I think is definitely worth taking a look at, particularly given the outrage over Sobaldi and some of the other um, stuff going on in Congress, um, is does the VA's particular procurement rule, right, where it can negotiate benefits for discounting, right, so that $40,000 reflects a discount for the VA and its patient population. It is normally for you and I $80,000. That combination of benefits for discounting, the ability to procure nationally for its patient population, um, how do you sort of balance that with any conflicts of interest when we might have a government-owned technology purchased by the government from a licensee who's making this stuff, right? Because they're going to need a manufacturing partner or commercialization partner. Um, and then revenues are going to flow back to those federal employee inventors, right? So every time the VA buys one of these catheter AFib things, that's a, not a cardiac person, AFib things, every time the VA buys one, right, some of that revenue goes back to the inventor, who's a VA employee. That creates a conflict of interest. It's an institutional conflict of interest and personal conflict of interest. Um, should we be thinking about those types of questions, sort of considering um, who gets to own the technology and how sort of inventive relationships work? Um, so that's kind of where I am. Next steps, um, again, sort of going back to the motivation question, sort of why do inventors invent, it's particularly in the translational medicine space. Um, I think lots of people invent in this space because they want to solve problems that are personal to them or they're relatively altruistic, but it always comes with this idea of commercialization and how does that influence um, what you think about ownership and how you behave in the ownership space. Um, and then a closer study of these contractual arrangements by and between uh, the VA, academic affiliates, dual appointment inventors, um, and how people behave under these, con under these contracts in terms of conflicts of interest, at what rate do they disclose their inventions, who do they disclose to, who do they think they need to disclose to, um, at what rate do they patent, et cetera. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. If you have like suggestions or inputs, please contact me. I'm available. Um, I'd love to talk about this kind of stuff, and I'd love to get your ideas um, if some come to you after our session. Um, and now we can chat, answer questions till the snacks arrive. Yeah, George. So uh, I'm just curious. If you're still in the daddy oven phase. I, yeah, I, I yeah. understand that, but. Like, where, where is this headed, you know, I mean, other than it's complicated? It's complicated, yeah, yeah. Like, what's the answer? What's the like, angle? Where yeah. are you, so, what's your motive um, thing here? Um, I don't know that I have one yet. Um, and so I think that what, um, what's sort of driven these questions is much more um, understanding how it works and teaching how it works to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always kind of been my role in um, the Center for Law and Biomedical Sciences. Um, sort of separate from sort of more theoretical work that I kind of do at my desk. Um, and so I sort of think of this project as more uh, sort of untangling some stuff so that we can then have some conversations about it. Um, but if you have normative ideas, do let me know. No, yeah. it seems um, like it does not have a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> it, may, it, may be, it may be that sort of figuring out where the pressure points in the mess are might reveal a better statutory scheme or uh, might reveal a better contractual arrangement, or even a, a more centralized sort of way of handling VA stuff. Um, that's the end goal, I think, once kind of I work through some of the untangling. Can you, uh, once you untangle, can you put the stuff back together in a better way, or are we better off just untangled and everybody knows we're untangled? I don't know. You might, as you untangle, you might, I mean, it seems like the kind of thing where you could do some taxonomizing, right, of the types of blends that you've got in the right. multi multiplex. You know, federal funding agency, federal laboratory, federal laboratory you know, right, yeah. students, faculty members, companies, you know, like it's probably a half a dozen different yeah, yeah. players and like how, you know, where their lines cross at each one of those vertices, you've got a different set of ownership problems and and you might be able to classify them or group them or you know put them in some way so that it's easier at least to get your mind around and, and then you can count them too right I mean then right. if you've got a classification system you could go around and look at 20 different universities and see how many right are there and that thing kind of I'm curious about what student yeah 
I was just wondering, does the T like the TBC office ever advise faculty people on um, disclosing or not disclosing like research updates in articles they want to publish, just in journals? They do, as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have those conversations with our student inventors mm -hmm. um, who we know about the competition. That is a public disclosure. Uh, but occasionally, they'll want to do a pitch event outside of the competition. And so they'll ask us for legal advice, and we'll tell them we can't give them legal advice. <laughs> um, but the public disclosure question is really important to both the people at the TBC and the people who work with the TBC. Um, and so there is some tension there, because there's a lot of pressure on us as academics to do public disclosures, to go to meetings, to do poster presentations. Um, but the TVC will advise you not to do them, as far as I can tell. Have you worked with them? Have they not advised you not to do them? Well, I haven't worked with the TVC, but I've been in research meetings where you know the faculty are like, maybe we shouldn't put that on the poster. We don't want people to know this yet. Yeah, yeah. That is mostly driven from the TVC. And, and many um, what we might call repeat players at the TVC or uh, some people call them star faculty, but I feel like that kind of <laughs> uh, makes us non-star faculty feel a little less special. Um, we don't do that here at the law school. That's right, that's right. We're all stars here. Um, but some TVCs will single out faculty who have been very, very successful in commercialization efforts, and those faculty members are very sophisticated in these things, right? They're going to know um, that our, our patenting system is a first-to-file system. They're going to know that you can't make a disclosure if you want to protect your international rights, right? They're going to know the types of things that I kind of thought were too far in the weeds for us to have a conversation about here, uh, but they're very important pieces of obtaining patent protection, and that involves your invention not being in the public domain before you make your filing. Yeah, there's a question here. Well, I just uh, wanted to suggest that one of the solutions to your situation, and it's probably already been presented, is this provisional patent application. Without actually completing the patent application after a year into a full application, but continuing to chain that application with newer disclosures. So every time there's a bulletin board you're going to have outside the meeting, you want to disclose that in a provisional application and just roll it forward into future provisional applications that don't uh, necessarily mature into patents until the technology has sort of come to fruit. And, uh, yeah, that's harder to do after... The, old, the, the earlier filed ones, you just drop off. You just let them die, and they're never published. Yeah, that's harder to do after the American Invents Act with the first to file provisions. Of course it is. It's a, um, it's a reform. It's magical. Um, but the TV, so if you approach the TVC and you say, I'm making a disclosure two days from now, um, they'll typically rush and file a provisional placeholder application for you. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about joint ownership. So if I remember correctly, joint owners have the right to license independently, correct? Right. That's correct. And so if the VA is joint owner, they have the right to <laughs> license independently. However, it sounds like they have a contract where they share royalties with whatever other Right, owners. and my guess, without having gotten the agreement yet, my right. guess is that agreement prevents them from from licensing out from under the okay, other Yeah, party. that was my question. Yeah. If I were drafting that agreement, it That's certainly right. would. <laughs> However, I am not, and I haven't even seen it, so I can't say. Yeah. Yeah, my question is a little bit less complex, but so you spoke about like student options, right? So we're in between. We don't really have anything solid right now. Do you think it's like a viable option for them to have the option between like whole ownership and the, and like going to the TBC? So they currently it our so the what we the understanding that we've gotten for our competition. And I think this is how it applies for BioInnovate and BioDesign and other sort of competitions that where we don't provide any services. Um, is that the students own their inventions, but they're free to use the TBC if they're willing to give up ownership of their invention. So if they would like to get TBC services, right, have TBC provide de-risking, looking for licensing partners, um, getting patent protection outside of us, I don't know why you want to do that. Um, that students can choose that option, but in choosing that option, they assign 100% of their right title and interest in the patent to the TBC. I was right. going to add to that, yeah. That it's, it's also and they get back the 40% revenue share. 
just as though they were a faculty member. But is that something that you think like will extend to the rest of campus though? So like I understand that it's just for this, like for bench bedside, but for the you know, way people in Lausanne and the, the way that we think of it for students outside of the competitions where we have some conversation from the general counsel's office is driven by policy seven. Dash. Um, invention policy, which is our faculty invention policy, which is anybody who uses non-incidental university resources, including students, would be subject to ownership by the university. I was just going to yeah. say, the, the problem that you have um, if you were a student is, A, the TVC might not have bandwidth to take you on. That is another issue that we run into with our competition. Even B, for teams with faculty knowledge, we've drafted some of those patent applications. Right. And B, the timeline for these competitions is such that the TVC is used to dealing in years, not months, and so. Right, and uh, students, I'm just throwing this out here, are their lowest priority. S star people. Um, <laughs> and then sort of trickle down to uh, Mora invented this thing <laughs> using some uh, non incidental <laughs> university resources. <laughs> Um, she might be a star inventor one day, but today she is student Mora, um, and how should we put her in the hopper? And you're going to be at the bottom of the hopper, right? Um, and so they've approached us to draft some patent applications that really should be drafted by them because they have faculty on them and they're owned by the university because they run out of time and bandwidth closer to the competition time. Um, these are really not things you should think like, like, oh, I have, a, I have a disclosure I'm making tomorrow night, maybe I should draft a patent application tonight. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, uh, gives me high esteem to think about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't be wrong, but most teams I've seen at least like fight tooth and nail to not go with the TBC. Another issue here um, at the University of Utah is that our TBC has had a bit of a uh, public relations slash customer service issue um, <laughs> that I think is improving as I interact with them over the past couple of years. Uh, but it was quite bad a number of years ago, and part of the reason uh, that the CMI approached the law school to kind of help out on some of these things was they were very displeased with how the TBC was handling some of these student applications and really wanted to be disconnected from the TBC in that way. Um, and so I think some of that institutional uh, remembering of bad times and bad ownership of the TBC um, carries over, I think, to students. And I think there are some faculty members who still talk about it that way. I'm 100% sure there are some high profile faculty people who don't make disclosures to the TBC, even, so, even though they should. And that was happening when we sat down to talk about revising the invention policy. There was apparently some egregious orthopedics people who just started their own startups, never made any disclosures, even though they were laboring under employment agreements and had received funding from a federal agency. That, I'm sure, still happens, hopefully at a lower level, uh, since we made the policy a little bit more generous for faculty. Yeah. What stops some of the students from just doing similar to what Dr. Shival did, like, did, of like creating a company and employing some? There's nothing, right? That stops them. From. What's the policing function? Like, what do we do, right? If you fail to make a disclosure, what, what, what is the policing mechanism? That might be one sort of small normative question. Um, we think it's important to force the disclosures, but if there's no nothing happens if you don't and you've made a gazillion dollars and now live in the Caribbean <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're still paying forty thousand dollars per treatment right so that's like the the problem is that the, the pricing of these drugs and devices is very much disconnected sometimes from how much it costs to manufacture them and how much we're trying to recapture of the research and development phase much of it goes toward advertising um, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so if we frame the patent system as meant to sort of equate um, research and reward, right, we're never going to get the right formula. And we're always, if we accept that we're always going to get it wrong, how wrong does it need to be before we start asking ourselves, this is not the right way to do it. Um, and I don't, this might be an outlier, or maybe this is common. You know, it's common, maybe we should be rethinking what our incentive structure looks like, or implementing something like compulsory licensing, um, which we've been very low to implement here in the United States. Yes, yeah, Sarah. So with these like orthopedic doctors that are <coughs> going outside of the TBC and not disclosing things like they should, 
Uh, if the university, I mean, I guess is kind of running low on bandwidth to even get patents filed, I mean, I, I'm assuming they don't have resources to really go after any of these people for a patent infringement or like for like ownership rights. That's so, the thing, like infringement would be separate. Like, are they making, I guess, and it wouldn't be infringement, so the, you can only sue for infringement if you own the patent. Right, so I guess it would be more of like It'd a contract more equitable dispute contract dispute, like, exactly. Okay. But I mean, I still feel like that would be so expensive for the university, so unless they wanted to like make an example out of one person and then kind of try to Which dissuade people from doing so. Which my understanding is they were unwilling to do. Yeah, like. Right, because these are still, and I believe, can't say for sure, but I believe that these orthopedic people no longer work here. I think they may have gone somewhere else. Um, but if that orthopedic surgeon is bringing in a million dollars worth of patient services as well, <laughs> is that a guy you want to get rid of? Do you want to get rid of Kyle Whittingham? <laughs> I don't know, right? You know, like those are those are very complicated questions. And I think if we sort of sit, you know, in our building and sort of think about a university as a very like uh, genteel nonprofit organization, they're making business decisions, and we should be cognizant of that. Sort of think about what the legal rules look like that kind of make it um, such that we're getting enough out of the invention to make the public better off. Right? Those are the important questions here. How do we balance these private rights, and private rewards, with the public interest in? both providing a patent system writ large and the public interest in these individual research projects and the university's mission. Um, and how do you solve all of that, right? Like it's hard. So does that have to be kind of like a second, a focus on those like second tier people maybe that aren't the stars that are getting all the attention but that probably could make some money off of these things that the university is not focusing on? Like would that be the target group kind of of Championing those yeah, people? Yeah, or like maybe appealing to those people in this whole situation? My, my understanding is that there is a whole group of people in the middle who are very good actors. They make an invention, they make an adequate disclosure, they answer all the questions the TBC asks them to answer, they get their revenue share, make no complaints, are happy with the TBC services. You know, it's really kind of like squeaky wheels that kind of drive the bus in some of these situations. Um, and not you know, like the the narrow uh, narrow 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 um, Dr. Narabon, um, the AFib sort of device, that's completely shared with the VA, right? He made a proper disclosure. He created a startup that's driven by the University of California system, right? All up and up, all above the board. That doesn't mean it's a cheap device. Um, it doesn't mean there's not conflicts of interest if we procure it and sort of provide revenue back to the employee, but that's not his fault, right? That's just kind of how the law is set up and how the VA is set up to kind of do research as well as the procurement part. I think we probably... So we transition to snacks? But Excellent. Thank you. So much.